Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. In this chapter, we journey back to the year 333 BC to the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean, where the ancient city of Tyre stands as a testament to human ingenuity and resilience. This chapter, titled The Siege of Tyre, unfolds one of the most pivotal moments in Alexander the Great's conquests, showcasing his strategic brilliance and unyielding determination. Tyre, a city set on a small island, was the center of trade and naval power in the ancient world. Its formidable defenses and isolation on the sea presented a unique challenge to Alexander's ambitions. But this chapter is more than just a tale of military conquest. It's a window into the changing character of Alexander, from a leader known for his generosity and strategic acumen to one whose methods and decisions start to reflect the burdens of power and the complexities of his expansive ambitions. So sit back, relax, and let us transport you back in time to witness the Siege of Tyre, a pivotal event that shaped not only Alexander's legacy, but also the course of history. Chapter 7. The Siege of Tyre, B.C. 333. Tyre was a city located on a small island, about three or four miles wide, on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It was considered the most important trading city in the world at that time, and it had a strong naval presence with its fleets and ships sailing across the entire Mediterranean region. Tyre was originally built on the mainland. However, due to wars with the kings of Babylon in the east, the inhabitants abandoned the old city and constructed a new one on an island near the shore. This new location allowed for better defense against enemies. The old city was in ruins, replaced by old walls, fallen towers, stones, columns, arches, and other remains from its ancient glory. The island where the Tyre of Alexander's time stood was located about half a mile away from the shore. The water in between was around 18 feet deep, and it created a harbor for the ships. The main activity of the Tyrians was trade. They bought and sold goods in all the ports of the Mediterranean Sea and transported them using their merchant ships back and forth. They also had fleets of war galleys, which they used to protect their interests at sea and in the ports their merchant vessels visited. They were wealthy and powerful, but they lived isolated on their small island and were mostly self-sufficient, not relying heavily on the mainland. The city, although smaller due to the island's size, was tightly built and well fortified. It had numerous grand buildings filled with wealth amassed over many generations through trade and thrift. According to historians and geographers, the structures in Tyre were built on a large scale. They claimed that the walls were 150 feet high. The walls were built from the water's surface, and a large part of their height had to be raised to match the land's surface level. Additionally, they had to be constructed to the typical height of a city wall to provide protection to the buildings and houses inside. There may have been some places where the walls themselves, or structures connected to them, were built up to the mentioned height, although it is unlikely that this was their usual size. In any case, Tyre was a rich and powerful city, focused on its trade and well-equipped to protect its interests at sea. However, it had little interest and involvement in the ongoing conflicts between the rival powers controlling the land. Their policy was to maintain their independence while maintaining good relations with other countries, allowing for uninterrupted trade with all nations' ports. It was an important question for Alexander to decide what to do about the port as he traveled through Phoenicia and near Tyre. He didn't want to leave it and go east because if anything bad happened to him, the Tyrians would probably turn against him. They had a lot of power in the Mediterranean and could easily attack him along the coasts of Greece and Asia Minor. However, it seemed difficult to attack the city. 
he only had soldiers, and the island was a short distance from the shore. In addition to its tall walls, the city was protected by well-equipped and manned ships. It couldn't be surrounded and starved into surrender because the people had money to buy and ships to bring in plenty of food and supplies by sea. Alexander, however, decided not to go after Darius to the east and leave this important place behind. The people of Tyre wanted to avoid a fight if they could. They sent nice messages to Alexander, congratulating him on his victories and saying they didn't want to fight him. They also sent him a golden crown, like many other Asian states, to show their submission to his authority. Alexander responded kindly and informed them that he planned to visit Tyre to offer sacrifices to Hercules, the god worshipped by the Tyrians. The people of Tyre knew that wherever Alexander went, he led his army. When he came to Tyre, it meant that he would take control of the city with his military. They thought it might be challenging to remove him from their castles and palaces once he settled in. They informed him that they couldn't welcome him in the city, but he could still perform the planned sacrifice on the mainland where there is a temple dedicated to Hercules among the ruins. Alexander then gathered his officers and shared his thoughts. He explained that after careful consideration, he had decided to delay his expedition into Persia's heart. His plan was to first conquer Tyre and gain control of the Mediterranean Sea. He also mentioned that he planned to capture Egypt before attacking the forces of Darius in the east. The army generals agreed with this plan, and Alexander moved towards Tyre. The people of Tyre prepared to defend themselves. After carefully considering everything, Alexander came up with a daring plan. He decided to build a wide causeway using the remains of the old Tyre, connecting the mainland to the island where the city was located. Then, he would lead his army across the causeway to the city walls, where he could set up his weapons and create an opening. This seems like a very difficult task. It is true that there are enough stones on the site of the old city to build the pier, but the work will face strong opposition from the city walls and the Tyrian ships in the harbor. It might seem very difficult to keep the men safe from these attacks, and continue the operations, especially as the work gets closer to the city walls. However, despite these concerns, Alexander decided to continue. Tyre must be taken, and it was clearly the only way to do so. Their deep emotional bond with Alexander, their belief that whatever he planned and attempted would be successful, the new and daring idea of reaching an island by constructing an isthmus to it from the mainland, these and other similar factors ignited the passion and enthusiasm of the soldiers to the utmost level. When building things in water, we use either stone or earth as the material. When using earth, we need to find a way to stop it from spreading in the water or getting washed away by the waves. This is usually done by driving long beams of wood, called piles, into the ground using powerful engines. Alexander sent groups of men into the mountains of Lebanon, where there were huge forests of cedars. These forests were famous in ancient times and are mentioned in the sacred scriptures. They chopped down the trees and carried the trunks to the shore. They sharpened one end of the trunks and stuck them into the sand to protect the sides of their embankment. Some people brought stones from the ruins and threw them into the sea where they wanted to build the pier. It took some time before the work gained enough progress to gain significant attention from Tyre. Eventually, when the city's residents noticed it growing in size and moving closer to them, they realized they needed to take serious action to stop its advancement. They built engines on the walls to throw heavy projectiles over the water at the people on the pier. They secretly sent messages to the tribes living in the valleys and ravines among the mountains, instructing them to attack the workers. They also disembarked troops from the city at a distance from the pier, and then marched along the shore, trying to force the workers who were carrying stones from the ruins to leave. They also prepared and manned some large galleys, and brought them close to the pier. 
they attacked the men working on it with stones, darts, arrows, and various projectiles. But all the effort was in vain. Despite the obstacles, the work continued. Alexander constructed sturdy wooden screens on the pier and covered them with hides. This provided protection for his soldiers against the enemy's weapons, allowing them to safely continue their operations. Thanks to these measures, the work progressed further for a certain distance. As it moved forward, many buildings were built on it, especially on the sides and at the end facing the city. These buildings included large machines for driving piles and machines for throwing stones and darts. There were also tall towers where men could throw stones and heavy weapons down on the ships that tried to get close to them. The Tyrians decided to destroy the wooden works using a type of ship called a fire ship. They filled a large galley with various flammable materials. They loaded it with light dry wood first and then poured pitch, tar, and oil over the wood to make it burn more intensely. They soaked the sails and the ropes in the same way and placed flammable materials throughout the entire ship. This way, when a fire was started in one area, it would quickly spread and set the entire ship on fire at once. They pulled this ship on a windy day close to the enemy's works and on the side where the wind was blowing. They then moved it towards the pier where there were many engines and machines. When they reached a safe distance, the men on board set the trains on fire and escaped in boats. The flames quickly spread throughout the vessel. The ship floated towards Alexander's structures, despite his soldiers' best efforts to keep it away. The frames, engines, and large, complex machines that had been built caught fire, and the entire mass quickly burned down. The men tried very hard to protect their things, but it didn't work. Some were hit by arrows and darts, some were burned to death, and others fell into the sea because everything was chaotic. Finally, the army had to retreat and leave behind everything that could burn in the large structure they had built, which was consumed by the fire. Soon after, the sea also helped the Tyrians. During the storm, a large swell from the sea caused extensive erosion and washed away a significant portion of the pier. The impact of a strong sea on solid structures is much more significant than one would expect unless they have seen it themselves. The heaviest stones are taken out, the strongest fastenings are broken apart, and the most solid embankments are undermined and washed away. The storm, in this situation, destroyed the work of many months in just a few hours, while Alexander's army watched from the shore in shock. After the storm ended, and the initial feeling of sadness and frustration had faded for the men, Alexander got ready to continue the work with renewed determination and enthusiasm. The men started fixing the pier and making it wider to make it stronger and able to hold more weight. They brought entire trees to the edges of the pier and sunk them, including the branches, to the bottom to create a platform. This was done to prevent the stones from sinking into the slimy ground. They constructed new towers and engines, which were protected with green hides to make them resistant to fire. As a result, they resumed their advancement towards the city, gradually approaching it in a more menacing and powerful manner than before. Alexander realized that the Tyrian ships were causing him a lot of trouble, so he decided to gather and prepare his own fleet. He did this in Sidon, a town not far from Tyre. He went on board the fleet himself and sailed into the Tyrian seas. He had different levels of success with this fleet. He connected many of the ships together, two by two, with some distance between them. Then, he placed a platform over the enclosed space where the soldiers could stand and fight. The men also built machines on these platforms to attack the city. These machines were of different types. There was a device called the battering ram, which was a long and very heavy wooden beam with an iron or brass head. This beam was hung in the middle by a chain so that soldiers could swing it back and forth. Its head would hit the wall with each swing, sometimes causing the wall to be damaged. 
They also had machines for throwing large stones or wooden beams using the elastic force of strong wooden or steel bars or twisted ropes. The soldiers would pull back the part of the machine where the stone was placed. When released, the machine would throw the stone into the air with great speed and power. Alexander's double galleys worked fine when the water was calm. However, sometimes when they were caught in rough waves, the waves would roll and twist them, causing the platforms to rip apart and the men to sink into the sea. Thus, unexpected and difficult challenges kept coming up. However, Alexander remained determined and faced them all. The Tyrians, feeling increasingly pressured and realizing that the approaching dangers were becoming more and more serious each day, eventually decided to send a large group of women and children to Carthage, a major trading city in Africa. They were determined not to surrender to Alexander, but to continue resisting until the end. The final moments of a siege, particularly if the place is eventually taken by force, are indescribably terrifying. They wanted to spare their wives, daughters, and helpless children from having to witness such horrors. Meanwhile, as the siege continued, the groups grew angrier with each other. They treated the prisoners they captured with increasing cruelty, believing they were only responding to the other side's worst actions. The Macedonians came closer and closer. The city's resources were slowly cut off and its strength weakened. The engines moved closer to the walls and the battering rams started to hit them, creating breaches. Eventually, a significant gap was discovered on the southern side that was deemed accessible. Alexander started getting ready for the ultimate attack and the Tyrians faced the dreadful possibility of being captured by force. Still, they refused to surrender. Surrendering at this point wouldn't have made much difference, but it could have prevented some of the terrible events that followed. Alexander was extremely frustrated by the prolonged resistance of the Tyrians. They probably couldn't have stopped the destruction, but maybe they could have avoided it being as bad as when 30,000 soldiers broke through their walls and stormed their city in a frenzy. The breach that Alexander planned to use to enter was on the south side. He prepared ships with raised platforms on them so that when they got close to the walls, the platforms could be lowered to create a bridge. The soldiers could then cross over the bridge to reach the broken parts of the wall and climb up through the breach. The plan succeeded. The ships moved forward to the planned landing spot. The bridges were lowered. The men rushed over them and reached the base of the wall. They climbed up through the gap and reached the battlements above, despite the Tyrians crowded the passage and fought fiercely. Many were killed by projectiles and stones, their bodies falling into the sea. Without paying attention to the fallen, the remaining individuals continued their climb up the damaged wall until they reached the battlements above. The large crowd then moved along on top of the wall until they reached stairways and slopes that allowed them to go down into the city. They then spread out over the streets and unleashed their accumulated hatred and rage, which had been growing for seven months, by entering houses and killing and destroying everything in their path. Thus, the city was attacked. After the soldiers were tired from killing the unfortunate people in the city, they discovered that many were still alive. Alexander's reputation for being generous and patient was tarnished because of the cruelty he showed towards them. Some were killed, some thrown into the sea, and it is even said that 2,000 were crucified along the seashore. This may mean that their bodies were placed on crosses after they were killed by a less cruel method than crucifixion. In any case, we often see signs from this time that wealth and authority were starting to have their usual negative impact on Alexander's personality. He became arrogant, bossy, and mean. He no longer had the humble and kind qualities that he had in the beginning of his life and started to take on the personality and actions of a military hero. A good example of this is shown by his response to Darius during the storming of Tyre. Darius had sent a second message proposing peace terms, and he replied to it. Darius offered him a lot of money to release his mother, wife, and child. 
he also agreed to give up all the land he had taken, including everything west of the Euphrates River. He also offered him his daughter Statira in marriage. He advised him to accept these conditions and be satisfied with what he already had. He warned him that if he tried to cross the large rivers in the east on his way to the Persian territories, he would not succeed. Alexander responded that if he wanted to marry his daughter, he could do it without asking for permission. He didn't need money for the ransom, and it was silly for Darius to offer him land that was no longer his. Alexander had crossed many seas since leaving Macedon, so he wasn't worried about any rivers in his path. He would keep chasing Darius wherever he went for safety and protection, and he was confident he would eventually find and defeat him. It was a mean and cruel message to send to the unhappy king whom he had already hurt so much. Parmenio suggested that he should accept Darius's offers. I would, he said, if I were Alexander. Yes, replied Alexander, and I would do the same if I were Parmenio. What a response from a young person of 22 to an esteemed general of 60, who had been a loyal and capable friend to both his father and himself for many years. The siege and storming of Tyre is widely regarded as one of Alexander's greatest achievements. The bravery, determination, and unwavering energy demonstrated by him and his army during the seven months of their arduous labor earned the admiration of the world. However, we cannot help but feel slightly detached from our sympathy for his character and interest in his fate due to the signs of arrogance, authoritarianism, and cruelty that start to emerge. While his reputation as a military hero grows, his standing as a person somewhat diminishes. But the change didn't happen suddenly. He endured the hardships and challenges of the siege along with the soldiers, and he was always willing to face the dangers they faced. One evening he was with a group in the mountains. One of his former teachers, Lysimachus, who always enjoyed going with him on such occasions, was among the few people with him. Lysimachus's was old and not very strong, so he couldn't keep up with the others during the walk. Alexander stayed with Lysimachus, while the others were told to continue. The road eventually became very rough, so they had to get off their horses and walk. Eventually, they got lost and had to stop for the night. They didn't have any fire, but they did see some campfires in the distance. The campfires belonged to the barbarian tribes that the expedition was targeting. Alexander went to the nearest campfire. There were two men lying next to it who had been placed there to guard it. He quietly approached them and killed them both, likely while they were sleeping. He then took a burning stick from their fire and brought it back to his own camp, where he created a large fire for himself and Lysimachus. They spent the night in comfort and safety. This is the story. How much we believe it, each reader must decide for themselves. One thing is for sure, though. There are many military heroes about whom such stories wouldn't even be made up. As we reach the end of Chapter 7 in our Alexander audiobook series on the Alexandria, we've journeyed through the gripping saga of the Siege of Tyre. Alexander's relentless determination and military genius were on full display as he conquered the impregnable island city, further cementing his reputation as one of history's greatest conquerors. In the upcoming Chapter 8, titled Alexander in Egypt, we follow Alexander's continued march of triumph and transformation. After his victory in Tyre, Alexander set his sights on Egypt, a land rich in history and mystique. This chapter unfolds a period less marred by warfare and more focused on statesmanship and the establishment of one of the world's most famous cities, Alexandria. Alexander's time in Egypt is marked by significant events, from his visit to the Oracle at the Oasis of Siwa, where he is proclaimed the son of Jupiter Ammon, to his strategic and insightful planning of Alexandria, a city that would become a beacon of trade, culture, and learning for centuries to come. Join us in the next installment of our series as we explore Alexander's Egyptian campaign, where his ambitions intertwine with the ancient mysteries and grandeur of Egypt.
Don't forget to subscribe to the Alexandria for more captivating historical narratives. Share this journey through the annals of history and witness the evolution of Alexander from a conqueror to a ruler with a vision for a new world order. Click on the video that will soon appear on your screen or find the link in the description to dive into the next part of Alexander's extraordinary journey. Stay tuned for Chapter 8, where the past continues to unfold in fascinating and unexpected ways.